Let's bring in our panel now. Joining me from Sydney is Gemma Tognini from GT Communications and also Caroline DeRusso, host of the Royal Report here, Royal Report here on Sky News, 10 o'clock Sundays. Uh, great to see you both. Are you joining us from Sydney or Perth, Caroline? I'm, I'm a little confused sitting over here in Adelaide, but um, you can clarify that. I'm in that. Perth. I'm in Perth. Oh, you are in Perth. We are. We have got the whole continent covered. The then we've whole got country. Uh, Sydney, Adelaide, and Perth. Just give, yeah, <laughs> give us your thoughts both. Uh, firstly, on this renewable energy stuff. These these offshore wind projects. These wind turbine wind farms on land. These uh, <laughs> solar farms. And we've just got another one approved in Queensland. Caroline, it's little wonder that people are upset about what this is doing to the landscape that they're living in, especially when we know it actually doesn't deliver reliable power. It doesn't seem to be solving any problems for us. No, totally. And, and look, I had the same bone to pick when things like biofuels were, were uh, really fashionable and you're using what should be a food source as a fuel source. And, and something like agricultural land, you know, we shouldn't... We shouldn't um, have com competition between those really important things that we need in life. We should we should do all that we can in a policy sense to make sure they're not competing against each other. It just makes absolutely no sense to me. But in that broader conversation on energy, look, everyone just needs to put their favourite pet projects aside. Everything needs to be looked at objectively. What is the net benefit? And, and it has to be a nose-to-tail analysis. You know, not just, oh, what is the cheapest for transmission, but how much does this stuff cost to produce? What are the other consequences, both to the environment, both to industry, the cost of... The, the amount of cement that goes into a wind farm, I would love to know the amount of emissions uh, that just go into the cement. So until we have that broad conversation where we net off all the pros and cons, no one's having an honest conversation with the Australian public. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are being fed a lot of nonsense, I think, by all sides of politics on this. Just before I come to you, Gemma, I want to note that the uh, the man behind the teals, the uh, renewable energy activist Simon Holmes Accord, has actually said that we there's no reason for Australia to have this nuclear ban in place anymore. I don't believe there is a compelling case for Australia's nuclear ban, he said. I think most people would now accept that nuclear is a potential climate solution. I don't normally go around quoting Simon Holmes a court, Gemma, but uh, he's spot on now. He's spot, he's spot on when it comes to this issue now. Well, you can chalk it up today, Chris, is the day that I agreed with him and I never thought that that day would come. But, you know, we must be flexible and agile in our thinking. Look, to your earlier point about renewables and particularly offshore wind farms, uh, analysts say that the offshore wind farm is the most, and I'm quoting now, the most commodity intensive, highest cost, least profitable part of the renewable spectrum and should not even exist. What's more, I wrote about this in my column in The Weekend Australian last weekend when I invited Bob Brown to come back and save the environment. The European Commission of Auditors has just coined this beautiful gentle euphemism called uh, the green dilemma. And what it's saying is what we already know, that most of these technologies are not in fact green. They are hurting the environment. And I just want to remind the Australian public and indeed the Environment Minister that right now in Australia, 20% of threats to koala habitat come from renewable projects. In past years, the last five years, I think it is in South Australia, the single biggest cause of loss of biodiversity from land clearing was because of solar projects. If that is the impact of this technology, there is nothing green about it. Energy policy has been the single biggest area of policy failure, in my view, on successive governments, um, not just the current Labor government, but successive governments over the past 15 years. And now we're coming to what can absolutely be described as a pending crisis in this space. This is not the time to be fiddle-farting around, pardon the expression, my father used to love it, with these sorts of projects when we have reliable, affordable gas at our fingertips and the rest of the world is looking at us going, you're crazy. Yeah, absolutely spot on. I think the other point that uh, Simon Holmes' court made was uh, that we don't need uh, 
this nuclear ban to go immediately because it'll be 10 or 20 years before small modular reactors are viable. Now, I say get rid of the ban straight away, and this is where I think the coalition should be more honest, and that is that uh, old-fashioned built large nuclear reactors ought to be on the table as well. Uh, I think the small modular reactors just sound like an easy one. You just plug it in. But there's got to be a case for uh, old-fashioned nuclear reactors to be built at places like the Hunter Valley, the Latrobe Valley, the Iron Triangle in South Australia. We will see. I want to get uh, back to this issue of working from home and lazy workers and the like and remind people what Tim Gurner, the property developer in Melbourne, said last month. We need to see unemployment rise. Unemployment has to jump 40, 50%, in my view. We need to see pain in the economy. We need to remind people that they work for the employer, not the other way around. Yeah, way over the top. Apologise for those comments, Caroline. But it's no surprise to see that in the UK and elsewhere, bosses are saying that their, their workers are entitled. Uh, they, they can't get them back to work. What's it going to take uh, for Australian <laughs> companies to be able to get people back to the office? Well, I think at some point, you know, employers have to put their foot down. In a sense, it's kind of like parents who want to be best friends with their kids. Like, you've got different imperatives. Uh, your imperative is to not be going into insolvency. So whatever is, I suppose, necessary, taking, of course, the, the employee's welfare and all of those things into consideration, but, but companies need to be viable. I don't really um, particularly like the idea of about them being entitled, particularly when we're talking about that very young part of uh, the generation, the Generation Zs, uh, because they, well, they started their work life during COVID. So I actually think it's probably more a product of inexperience than anything. They went into the workplace thinking that everyone, you know, worked in their pyjamas, and that's actually not the way that business is done. That is not the way you build teams. That is not the way you build experience. And that's surely just not the way that work gets done. Yes, some flexibility is fine, but you can't be at home all the time and then complain you don't get work or you don't get promotions or you're not as skilled up because you're totally isolated from that work environment. And, and I really did feel for graduates uh, who started their careers during COVID, and obviously I come from a law background, I can't even imagine what it must have been like to, to have started that experience without being able to look, you know, firsthand at, at how things are done. And, and I really do feel for their feel for them in the sense of the lack of development of their skill sets, but also their lack of understanding of the way that a good, productive, good cultural workplace um, functions. Yes, indeed. We're going to be grappling with this for some time to come. Gemma, I've got to get your thoughts on the AFL Grand Final. Congratulations to your <laughs> bloody Collingwood. You were there on Saturday. Really but now was. there's talk about shifting it to, uh, to twilight. Uh, give us your thoughts. I couldn't care less. I've been to a winning Collingwood grand final. Chris, I've peaked and I'm probably never going to go to the footy again. <laughs> it's very, very simple. Look, it, 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 it's, um, it, it's, I don't know that a, a twilight grand final would be a bad thing. I mean, it's a magnificent day. It's a magnificent event. And I didn't get arrested. I didn't see anyone get arrested. Um, it was just, you know, I'm still sort of bathing in the afterglow, pardon the expression, Chris, but I think a grand final at twilight would be magnificent because, of course, at the end of the day on Saturday, uh, the mighty, mighty Collingwood Football Club ended up in the, the sunny quarter of the MCG, glaring straight into the sun for the final quarter of football. So I think at least that would remove that element of the game for both sides. And look, everybody loves a night game of footy. I don't think it can be a bad thing. I think it'll be great for TV ratings. Now, I notice on social media you've uh, shared with us uh, this rendition of you as a, you in character <laughs> as a Collingwood supporter on Saturday. That, <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was courtesy. He knows who he is. That's my brother's my brother's best friend who I met when I was nine. He's the, he's the other brother I never asked for, but I'm very grateful that I have. He sent that to me and he said, I've fixed up your photo, mate. Good luck for the game. Mind you, he's a dirty Carlton supporter, so so you'd expect nothing less, right? <laughs> exactly. That's well, it gold. was just I a fantastic it. game and good on you. <laughs> fantastic you were there. Now, we're just we're out of time now, but we've got to mention uh, Meghan Markle is being talked about as a fill-in replacement uh, in the US Senate. Tell us very briefly, Caroline, this is a joke. This ain't happening, is it? 
Oh, but I really wish it would because we would have content forever. <laughs> um, look, she, she's always been touted for politics. She's very, very interested in politics. Obviously, with uh, Dianne Feinstein passing away last week, a Senate position has opened up in California. Uh, Gavin Newsom, who's the governor, gets to captains, pick that spot, understand that he had a, a Zoom call with Megan, but she wasn't ultimately chosen. Um, although Newsom wanted a black woman, um, he did he did choose a lady by the name of Lafonza Butler, I believe. Um, she, I don't think, was necessarily in the running. What's happening is because um, the election is next year, a whole bunch of people have already nominated, but he doesn't want to, I suppose, captain's pick out of, yeah. you know, the ones who have already nominated to give him a head start. So it's essentially filling a sure. casual vacancy. Just pick. Uh, she's not in. She's not in. Megan's not in. It's a shame. Pick. Pick, Megan. Pick Meghan Markle, I reckon. Chuck her in there. It'll be a lot of fun, as you say.